Aging and disease are biochemical processes that happen over many decades. So if we track and optimize well-established biomarkers of organ and systemic function, can aging and disease risk be slowed? So apologies if you've heard that a trillion times. That's the main focus of the channel. And with that in mind, earlier in September, September 6, 2024, I blood tested for the sixth time in 2024. And note that this is test number 54 since August of 2015. So with that in mind, what's my biological age? And we'll see that using Dr. Morgan Levine's biological age calculator, PhenoAge. And if you have blood test data and want to calculate your own biological age using this metric, there'll be a downloadable Excel file in a link from my website in the video's description. No email required. All right, so when entering these data, I get a biological age of 38.6 years, which is 13 years younger than my chronological. But note that this is just one test. And it's important not to get too high or too low for one test. It's important to look at year to year changes. So with that in mind, let's see more context and look at all biological age results using this test since 2018, which is what we'll see here. So when I first started testing in 2018 to 2019, I only had three tests and with an average pheno age or an average biological age of 36.1 years. So then thinking that three tests over a two year span is not enough to evaluate year to year changes, I started testing more often, testing six times each in 2020 and 2021. And in both of those years, average pheno age was 35.6 years. So that's probably a closer approximation of the full year average as six tests is better than looking at three tests over a two year period. In 2022, I tested seven times with my best data yet, an average of 33.8 years. The data got a bit worse in 2023, seven tests, 34.7 years. And after the first six tests, including the most recent test, average pheno age in 2024 is very close to where it was in 2023, 34.6 years. Now, just as an interesting aside, note that this test on September 6th looks like an outlier relative to all the other tests in 2024. And at about the same time in 2023, also an outlier. Now, I don't know if these are seasonal effects or there's something going on in my environment in late August, early September, but I'm eager to find out. So I'll t check out the correlations and see what I can come up with so that I can avoid this fate around the same time next year in 2025. So what we can see from this six years plus of data is that I've avoided an age-related biological age increase. So biological age increases for every year of chronological age. So I've resisted that for at least this six-year period. Now, another way to look at the data is by subtracting biological age from chronological age. And when doing that in 2018 to 2019, chronological age minus biological age was nine to, nine to 10 years younger, which I was able to improve 2020 to 2021, 11 to 12 years younger, my best or close to my best data yet in 2022, 15 years younger. And that's the average of 15 years younger, looking at all of the tests for a given year. And then when considering 2023 and 2024 data, I've been able to maintain so far in the 15 to 16 years younger range, chronological age minus biological age. So within this context, we can see that the September 6th test, 13 years younger, is actually worse than average, not just by looking at it as an outlier, but relative use, uh, when using that chronological age minus biological age average for the full year, 13 years is worse compared to that. So I've got to get back to the 15 to 16 years or better going forward for the last two tests in 2024. At least that's the plan. All right, so rather than looking at data entered into a spreadsheet, let's take a look at the full blood test report uh, from the lab. And that's what we'll see here. So to generate these data, note that I don't go to my physician, which in the past has generally involved me essentially begging them to measure the things I want to measure. So in my case, now I'm able to go to ultalabs.com and there'll be a, a, an affiliate link in the video's description. Ulta Labs uses Quest Diagnostics. So I go to Ulta Labs, their website. I pick the tests I want to, want to measure on for that given test. I bring the lab form to Quest Diagnostics and then pay the, I think it's like a $10 lab draw fee. And then I get the results pretty quickly thereafter. So for this test, I measured in the morning on a Friday, around 7.30 in the morning, and got the results by around 6 o'clock, 6.20 the next day. So pretty fast turnover. So if you want to help support the channel while also testing yourself, again, there's an affiliate link in the video's description. So let's highlight some uh, highlights and some potential weak spots for room for improvement in the blood test report. And I think that's important because I don't want to just focus on phenoage, which have, may have blind spots. I want to focus on as many biomarkers of as many organ systems as possible. 
So let's start off with HDL, which I've covered many times in many videos. And HDL is currently a strength, but it wasn't always like that. So for the 11th test in a row, HDL is now in the optimal range for men, which is 50 to 60 milligrams per deciliter. And if you missed that video, it'll be in the right corner. So over those 11 tests, average HDL is 54 and a half milligrams per deciliter. In contrast, for the 43 tests prior to the past 11 tests, average HDL was about 45 milligrams per deciliter. So for those who struggle with raising HDL, my data shows that it can be increased and consistently maintained at that higher level for at least this 11 test period. All right, also we can see HSCRP. So for whatever reason, Quest Diagnostics has lowered their detection limit. It used to be less than 0.3 milligrams per liter. Now it's less than 0.2 milligrams per liter. And as we can see for this test, it was at that detection limit again, less than 0.2 milligrams per liter. Now that's important because for the ninth, 19th consecutive test, HSCRP is below the detection limit. So it's somewhere below 0.3 milligrams per liter. Another uh, sp uh, strong, sp strong spot, another uh, highlight is glucose at 87. So what's optimal for glucose is what's found in youth and what's associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk, which is 80 to 94 milligrams per deciliter. And let's take a look at that story because I haven't posted it in a while on the channel. So for those who may not be familiar, let's review the data for blood levels of glucose. So glucose increases during aging, which is what we'll see here. And this is in a study of 12.5 million people. So I always aim for the largest studies that I can find for a given biomarker, as that would be expected to be closer to the truth in terms of population-based averages. So if anyone that's watching comes across a larger study than any of the video, any that I post in the video, please post it in the comments. I'd be happy to give you a shout out in a future video. So for glucose, uh, average glucose levels in youth, so 18 year olds is around 85 milligrams per deciliter for both men and women which then increased to greater than 100 milligrams per deciliter in 88-year-olds. Now, age expected based on my current chronological age of 51.6 years, almost 52 in a few months, is 99 milligrams per, per deciliter. That's the average based on my chronological age, based on this plot. But for the first six tests in 2024, average glucose levels are 89.9, so 90 milligrams per deciliter, which is the average value for someone that's about 20 years younger chronologically. So the glucose data is one reason why phenoage is consistently younger, at least in my case. All right, what about all-cause mortality risk? So from the same study, and note that all the studies in the video will be in the video's description, so if you want to check it out yourself, it'll be in the video's description. 80 to 94 in this same study is associated with the lowest all-cause mortality risk, and that's what we'll see here. So on the y-axis, we've got the hazard ratio, so risk of death for all causes, plotted against fasting levels of glucose, fasting circulating levels of glucose. And in terms of lowest risk, we can see that green bar is in the 80 to 94 milligram per deciliter range. And then when glucose levels are less than 80 or higher than 94, we see a significantly increased all-cause mortality risk. All right, so back to the blood test data. Now it's time to highlight a weak spot, which triglycerides, at maybe not crazy high at 75, but this is a weak spot, at least based on my interpretation of the data. And we can see why, because lowest coronary heart disease, CHD mortality risk, is associated with triglycerides being less than 45 milligrams per deciliter. And that's what we'll see here. This is a study of 4.5 million people, and the data that I'm presenting is for 18 to 45 year olds. The data up to 64 year olds, which is a separate, separate plot, so 46 to 64 year olds in this study, is similar. This, that's why I didn't show it. But the data for triglycerides gets a bit different for people that are older than 65. Nonetheless, I try to focus on what youthful data looks like. So that's why I'm highlighting the 18 to 45 year age range. So on the y-axis, we've got the hazard ratio for CHD mortality risk, so risk of death from coronary heart disease plotted against circulating levels of triglyceride and we, or triglycerides. And we can see that when triglycerides are higher than about 45 milligrams per deciliter, all-cause mortality risk starts to increase. Now, if we only focused on the reference range, which lists less than 150 as quote-unquote optimal, or that's just their reference range, right? It doesn't necessarily imply optimal. That's just what they suggest that we should be at. We can see that using that as the cutoff, there's a 30% higher coronary heart disease mortality risk relative to using less than 45 as the cutoff. And when considering my current data of 75 milligrams per deciliter of this for this test, 
that would be associated with about a 15% increased risk of death from heart disease mortality risk relative to having less than 45. So the goal is to, in, in my case, the goal is to reduce triglycerides to less than 45, at least going forward. All right, so on to page two of the blood test report, which is what we can see here. So uric acid got flagged by the lab at 3.7 milligrams per deciliter as being low, which then raises the question, what's optimal for uric acid? So uric acid increases during aging, which is what we'll see here, with circulating levels of uric acid on the y-axis plotted against age from 20 to 80 years on the x-axis. So on the top plot in blue, we've got data for men, and in red, we've got data for women. So starting with the data for men in youth, average uric acid levels in 20-year-olds are 310 micromolar or 5.2 milligrams per deciliter. And then afterwards, there's a pretty slow but continuous increase for uric acid levels during aging, at least for men. For women, the story is a bit different. They start off with an average level of uric acid that's lower in 20-year-olds, which either decline or are basically flat until around 40. And then we can see a pretty close to linear and steep increase for uric acid levels in women up to 80 years. All right, what about all-cause mortality risk? So the values that are found in youth around five micromolar, uh, five milligrams per deciliter, sorry, or 300 micromolar are also associated with lowest risk of death for all causes, all-cause mortality risk, ACM risk, which is what we'll see here. So on the y-axis, we've got the hazard ratio for all-cause mortality, so risk of death for all causes, plotted against circulating levels of uric acid. And in terms of lowest risk, we can see that it's right there, that, you know, that mid spot of that J-shaped curve at about 5 milligrams per deciliter. So to put my most recent data into context, that 3.7 milligrams per deciliter, it will be somewhere there. Still pretty close to lowest risk, but it shows that I do have some room to increase it if I choose. Now, the reason I, ra the reason I raised that issue is because for the test before this, uric acid was a bit higher at 4.7 milligrams per deciliter. And in conjunction with that test, I had my best Horvath epigenetic age and uh, DNA uh, methylation-based estimation of telomere length. And to get there, one part of that story may be a higher protein intake and higher sardines, which may have increased uric acid. So that's the, the long story short there is I have some room to increase uric acid if I want to. And I may do that by increasing sardines with the goal of potentially keeping my epigenetic age metrics uh, relatively youthful. So stay tuned for that data in an upcoming video. All right, so back to the blood test report, and then we can see based on the what's found in youth and all-cause mortality risk that there's no reason to worry about that 3.7 uh, flag from the lab for uric acid. All right, so another new uh, test that I've added is GGT, gamma glutamyl transferase, which is a liver-specific enzyme. Relatively lower is better. I'll probably give GGT its own video as it may be an important biomarker for a different biological age tool, not phenoage. So stay tuned for that video too in an upcoming video. All right, weak spots, MCV. So the MCV for this test was 94.7, which is my highest value over 51 tests since 2015. All right, so that then raises the question, what's optimal for the MCV? So the MCV increases during aging. So on the y-axis, we've got the MCV plotted against age. This is from 26 to 90-year-olds. In youth, in, in this case, 26-year-olds, we can see that average MCV values in men were around 90, which then increased to around 94, an average value of 94, in people that were close to 90 years old. So to put my most recent data into perspective, 94.7 for MCV, that would be age expected for someone around or older than 90 years. So this is not great data. What about all-cause mortality risk? So that's what we'll see here. And this is a relatively small study, but this is the largest study that I was able to find for the association with MCV, which stands for the mean corpuscular volume. So that's the average volume of a red blood cell. Do you have very large uh, red blood cells or do you have very small red blood cells? So a, a relatively large MCV would be that I have very large uh, red blood cells, and smaller would be better, at least in terms of what's found in youth. So what about all-cause mortality risk? So again, this is a relatively small study. Anyone that's come across a larger study than 36,000 or so, please post it in the comments. I'd be happy, happy to give you a shout out. So the second quartile in this study was defined as the referent, so 90.5 to 93 for the MCV. And then the first quartile and the third quartile were not significantly associated with an increased or decreased all-cause mortality risk relative to the second quartile. But when the MCV became larger than 95.8, that was associated with an increased all-cause mortality risk. 
So to see that, we look at the 95% confidence interval. That's the data that I just boxed or rectangled in blue. And so for the first quartile, the 95% confidence interval overlaps with one. So that range, 0.83 to 1.34, overlaps with one. So that's not significantly different from the reference. But when looking at the fourth quartile, we can see that 1.15 to 1.8 is completely above a hazard ratio of one. So that's a significant increase in terms of the association for MCV with all-cause mortality risk. So from the all-cause mortality data, we can see that the MCV less than 95.8 is associated with lowest all-cause mortality risk. So to put my MCV of 94.7 into context, it would be what you would expect to find in someone who's of an older chronological age, and it's not too far away from the highest uh, all-cause mortality risk. Now, this is just one test, and it, the goal, again, is to look at year-to-year -year averages. Fortunately, my year-to-year -year average for the MCV is not 94.7 but the data went in the wrong direction, and now I've got to figure out what I can do to bring it back down closer to 90 or lower if I can. And the first part of that story is by looking at diet composition and supplements in terms of how they corresponded to this most recent test that was 13 years younger biologically. And as a part of that story, I look at correlations, I follow the correlations with the goal of optimizing biomarkers, including reducing MCV, re reducing triglycerides. So stay tuned for those videos coming up soon. All right, that's all for now. If you're interested in more about my attempts to biohack aging, check us out on Patreon. And before you go, we've got a whole bunch of discount and affiliate links that you can use to test yourself while helping to support the channel, including Ulta Labs, Epigenetic Testing, NAD Quantification, At-Home Metabolomics, Oral Microbiome Composition, At-Home Blood Testing with SciFox Health, which includes ApoB, but also Grimage, Green Tea, Diet Tracking with Coronameter, or if you'd like to support the channel, you can do that with the website, Buy Me a Coffee. We've also got merch, so if you're interested in wearing the Conquer Aging or Diet Trying brand, as I've got on here, that link and all of the other links will be in the video's description. Thanks for watching. I hope that you enjoyed the video. Have a great day.